for those of you who may not be so familiar with Health Data Research Network Canada, we are a, a network of organizations uh, across the country that are interested in supporting uh, the use of multi-regional data for research. Um, and we are very committed to the principles of equity and in Indigenous data sovereignty, public engagement, and many other aspects of the, um, the ways we think about um, appropriate uh, data use in, in, uh, in the current time. So really, uh, this, this series has been long in the making, understanding that in a multi-regional context, we need to think about perhaps different ways uh, of um, supporting the use of data. And that's what we're gonna be talking about today. So um, next slide, please. Um, before we get into the, um, the uh, content of everything, maybe we should say something about uh, why federated analysis. So part of, part of the interest in this is that capabilities and possibilities for the use of data are changing pretty rapidly. There's lots of different types and sources of data that people want to have access to and link and use. They don't necessarily all uh, live in the same place. So um, and technology development and perhaps more importantly, statistical developments are making it possible to consider different approaches to where the data reside versus where how they're actually used for analysis. So one um, possible approach, um, and th this is one possible approach that can help us within Canada, um, given the, the nature of our country and systems. I, I do want to emphasize in this introductory piece that we're we're not assuming that there's any one particular approach that's a single um, solution or a silver bullet. So we're not saying that federated analysis is going to take over and be the only way that we use data, but more options can make more things possible. And that's where we're coming at with the trying to learn something about this. We also see that um, federated analysis could help with international collaborations because of course there's share difficulties with sharing data across country borders and places like the UK and the European Union are working on different approaches to federation. So next slide, please. So why a collective learning series? Why did we take this particular approach to thinking about the uh, federated data? So um, one is that we wanted to share knowledge from experts on the state of, of the science as it is now. So as I noted, this area is moving quickly. Um, so a series of webinars seemed like a really good way to create some common understanding on what data federation is and how it could help address some of our, our ambitions and challenges in research. Uh, I'm expecting to learn a lot myself from the speakers we have over the series. I'm not sure that there's anybody who really understands all of the aspects um, in detail that we're gonna be covering. So that's kind of the point of it is to bring some common understanding. We then wanna translate the lessons learned into tools and resources that can be available to the broader research community. So in other words, we recognize that the the process of learning what is possible will point to the kinds of things we need to have in place in order to make the most of these potential opportunities. And in some cases, this is gonna mean developing new tools and possibly advocating for policies or investments or other resources that can help support multi-regional research. So next slide, please. So this is what we're gonna to cover today. Um, so this is a very, um, much a, a common introduction and grounding. So we're starting with um, very foundations of thinking about what we mean in, in federated analysis and federated data. Uh, so hence the, um, the focus on definitions, the Canadian context, uh, current practice for non full data and enablers for federated analysis. And then we'll tell you a bit about what's coming next in the series overall. So next slide, please. So we'll go on to some definitions. And what while we're while we were working through the planning for the series, we realized that we needed to have some some common definitions. So what I'm going to share are, is drawn from reports and papers, but it's important to say that the the language is a bit slippery. There's not really uh, in all cases a, a very clear common understanding of of these definitions. So I'm going to presenting be presenting how we've chosen to use this terminology in this context of this learning series, but acknowledging that you probably will see some of these words used differently um, and, and different concepts brought into them. So just, just so we have a common basis for this, you can go on to the next slide. And I'll start with the idea of what pooled analysis is. So this is, this is the analysis of individual data that are combined together from uh, multiple locations and or multiple different sources of data. And this is, this is what we think of as the sort of traditional 
analysis. When we're doing multi-regional research, we put all the data in a single place, it's pooled, and it's often, this is the desired default for um, multi-regional research. Though I would say perhaps that's in part because we don't understand what we can do when data aren't necessarily pooled. So next slide is um, distributed data. So here the idea is that data are stored across multiple organizations or institutions or data centers. So this might be distributed uh, as an organized for use and residing in the original place of collection, like a hospital or a health authority, or with researchers as longitudinal cohorts or other kinds of repositories. They might also be distributed, uh, meaning in, within data centers that are members of Health Data Research Network Canada or across different countries. But, they're, but they are distributed. Okay, so then the next definition is for federated data. And here what we're referring to is distributed data that are able to be analyzed together while remaining separate. So federated means that they're, they don't just live in these different silos, they're connected in some way. And they might be connected simply because they are um, defined in a common format, but they might also be connected in the sense of it being a technical uh, enablement for the kinds of um, things that we might hear about um, later in the series on statistical approaches and actual analysis capabilities. Um, so in other words, the implication is that the, there does need to be some sort of pathway or um, uniformity connection, something among these different um, data sets and for us to call them uh, federated. Okay, so, so the next one then, if we think about federated data, one aspect of federated data might be horizontal federation. And this, is, this I think is again, the traditional or the first kind of thing we might think about in this space. So horizontal federation means that the partitions or the federated sites all include the, uh, the same features or measures, but for different people. So this could be, for example, in the Canadian context, different provinces or territories holding the same hospital emergency room, demographic information for um, the, the people who are resident in their various jurisdictions. So in that case, we have the, the same kinds of measures and the same kinds of data, but for different people held in different places. Then the next one, though, we might also talk about vertical federation. Um, and the, the slide is not showing up to me. I'm hoping that it's okay for everybody else. So vertical federation is uh, where the partitions include the same people, but have different features. So what that means is um, this could be different data sets, one on healthcare use and the other a survey, or it could be um, uh, that there you have uh, a survey in one place and genetic information or genomic information in another place. And then the next definition is federated analysis. So this is where we're doing the analysis um, using data from across multiple different data sets where the data are not co-located. So for example, it's distributed data. And the idea here is that it's being done in a fast and secure manner. Again, sort of um, doesn't always necessarily imply a technical connection, but a technical connection can be the way that these things are done in, in a more efficient sort of manner. So federated, Federated data enables federated analysis uh, in the um, artificial intelligence space you'll hear later in the series uh, that can, is often referred to as federated learning, but we can think of those together. So next slide, please. If we think about this, so I think you might need to press one more time. There seems to be some animation in there. Um, there's, this implies a spectrum of options here. Um, so. What we've been talking about so far is how to arrange the data, where the data are housed, how they might be accessible for research. And as I, I indicated already, this, this is not really meant to be set up as an either or situation. There's likely times when different choices make sense. So it's important to understand the implications of, the, of these different choices. For example, um, in any kind of data arrangement or technical setup, the that, that implies certain kinds of um, requirements, where the data are stored and how you get access to them. Those things are equally true for pooled for, and for federated or distributed data. It's just the, the trade-offs and the choices that you might make might be different. 
So then we need to consider, for example, our ability to fulfill requirements for data sovereignty and the implications of these different choices for the that ability to, um, to, to do so. There are also considerations for the tools needed for analysis. Um, what I have seen so far of federated analytic approaches, you actually need to run your code a little bit differently or add a, an extra step in. It's not overly complex, um, but it does require a different set of tools and that implies a different set of training perhaps as well. Um, and then the, I think that perhaps the thing that occupies the minds of researchers the most is, is how robust is the analysis that can be done and in a federated environment, in a distributed environment versus in a pooled environment. So the questions we might overall ask ourselves are, does federated federation of data support robust science? Are there trade-offs if we use federated data? If so, what are those? And in what cases is federated data a good option? And when, in what cases is it not a good option? These are all really important questions. And, and I'd, I'd just underline and emphasize the, the scientific and empirical nature of them. And um, so in this case, I'm not referring to preferences based on our current knowledge or convenience, though that could be one of the trade-offs. But the, the focus here and one of the parts that we really want to learn over the series is what it, this means for our ability to actually produce um, the best science and the, the for the kinds of questions that we want to address. So next slide, please. I'm going to go on now to talk a bit about the Canadian context and why we are thinking about federation and federation and uh, data federation. The so next slide. So Canada, I think um, most people, if not all people, will understand in, in this presentation is a, it is a constitutional federation. And what that means is that the majority of health and social services are um, provided by provinces and territories. And from a constitutional perspective, the responsibility of pro provinces and territories. This means that um, policies are different. The data are generated differently. They use different technical systems. They often collect different variables. The coding systems used can sometimes be different. Um, and at least this is the case beyond some core um, pan-Canadian data, like hospital data, emergency department data, some aspects of vital statistics where there's been lots of work to, to create um, standards that have been accepted across the country. In other cases, those standards don't exist, they haven't been adopted, and it's, and it's really different. And, and I underline again that the policy environments are different. So the rules about who's covered for different services, how we collect data, all of these things are really quite different. And so we have to acknowledge that it's, it's a part of our constitutional federation. We also have commitments um, to the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, commitments to calls to action and reconciliation. And in all of these cases, federating data helps to address localization, data sovereignty, ongoing responsibilities regarding use of data, and I'd also add the need for ongoing community engagement. The finally, in some sense, keeping data separate helps to remind users that they're, they're, they're not necessarily commensurate or comparable in their original state. So as I said, the local policies and practice practices and changes in those may affect how we use and interpret data and how we actually um, work to make them comparable across locations. So next slide, please. So not all data need to be federated. And so there are pool, lots of resources for pooled um, data and that includes the Canadian Institute for Health Information and has a number of data sets that are available, Statistics Canada and the um, Canadian Research Data Center Network um, is another place that can researchers can go for access to data that have already been pooled in some way. Uh, the Canadian Partnership for Tomorrow's Health and the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging are examples of cohorts that both are, have a regional focus, but also have pan-Canadian data sets that are available to researchers. So there are places that you can get pooled data and these are amazing resources and what, what you need is in those, that's great. But there are many, many more data sets than these. And, the, and as I said already, the data sources and types that people want access to are increasing all the time. So Federation adds another option for data use. And uh, next slide, please. And here is where I'm going to pass it over to Robert for his piece. Excuse me. Hi, thanks, Kim. Um, if I could have the next slide, I'm just going to walk through 
a little bit of what's being done uh, in the Canadian setting um, with a couple of and and elsewhere with a couple of examples. I'm I'm just going to start here with some some basic ideas about how we do or how we or how we approach federated analyses. Uh, the first thing is we need some consistency across the sites. Uh, this is not a, an idea where we just run studies in the, the individual Canadian provinces and pull them together in order to really get something that's that's more useful from these results. We need something, some consistency across the sites. And we start with the simplest idea is the, uh, the idea of a common protocol and, and analytic plan. Um, this is what, for the bulk of our studies, the CNOs, the Canadian Network for Observational Drug Effect Studies does. Here, we're working in the individual provinces and we're working in American data and UK data as well. We'll write a common protocol and common statistical analysis plan that's shared across the sites. Um, this means everybody's working from exactly the same protocol, exactly the same analytic steps. Uh, one nice thing about this is that it then allows amendments for data variation between sites because as, as those of you who've worked with the Canadian administrative claims data know, there are differences between what's collected in the different provinces. Uh, a next step would be to standardize the data a little bit more and still use this common protocol approach. So work with those data sets so that they all look fairly identical and we can use that common protocol with a little more efficiency without resorting to uh, amending for data differences. And then the the third step that that is done in in typical practice is what we what we call a common data model. And this is a critical aspect that we're going to talk a lot about a lot more uh, over the course of this series of of lectures. And here the idea is you take the harmonization or standardization of the data to the next level so that the common data model transform data set from, for example, British Columbia has the identical structure to the common data model transformed data set from Alberta and Saskatchewan and Manitoba, so that we can we can then run rather than a common protocol or a common analytic plan, we can run common analytic code across the different sites. So all we would need to do is send a set of a set of programs to BC, to Alberta, to Saskatchewan, and then the results would be would be uh, produced back. And there are a number of different flavors of common data model that again we're going to cover in a in a future lecture. Um, if I could have the next slide, please. So now I'm just going to go through a couple of quick examples of how how these federated analyses can be done. The next slide. So C nodes, as I as we started with, is a network that, uh, at the request of Canadian stakeholders, does studies of typically drug safety. So this was a series of studies run at the request of uh, Ines, the the Quebec Drug Health Technology Assessment Organization, and Health Canada to look at. Uh, in cretin based drugs, which are common prescribed for diabetes and potential adverse events, two in the pancreas, pancreatitis and pancreatic cancer, and one uh, cardiovascular heart failure. Uh, in this, we ran studies with using the Canadian data across the country, uh, using international data as well, using a common protocol with a common analytic plan. So the analytic plan was sent to each of the sites and analyses were run, summary statistics were returned to the, the coordinating center for um, combination. This is 
done so that we have the identical study being done in each site and we have common common results coming back. If I could have the next slide, please. This is what the, the results of this kind of study look like. And this is a simplistic way of combining the, the results, but it's one that in a case like this is, is relatively straightforward um, given the, the relative homogeneity of the results. So this is just a random effects meta-analysis combining results from each of the sites that participated in this study. So you'll see that uh, the US market scan data, Ontario and Quebec provided a fair amount of information. CPRD, that's our UK database, provided a fair amount of information. Alberta and Manitoba, given their relative sizes, contributed relatively less and had wider confidence intervals around those results. The overall uh, association with pancreatic cancer suggested that there was no increased risk of pancreatic cancer with incretins versus sulfonylureas, which is another commonly prescribed uh, diabetes drug. If I could have the next slide, please. Uh, we're going to be talking more during the course of the series about uh, Odyssey, which stands for the observational, sorry, I can never remember the exact acronym, uh, Observational Health Data Science Initiative. Uh, this is an international collaboration that has taken a, a common data model approach to standardizing data sets and then running standard code against them. And I'm just using this as an example to show the scale at which these federated analyses can be, analyses can be done. Thank you, Jamie, for, for adding that, uh, for correcting me there. I knew I was gonna get the, the acronym wrong. Um, Odyssey is a group that can do things at enormous scale because the data across multiple sites across the world are standardized. And so Legend is one of the uh, large initiatives that Odyssey has done to look at large scale evidence generation across a wide uh, range of databases. So I'm gonna show one example on the next slide of something Odyssey has done. Um, you can't really see this, but this just shows the scale of a, a Legend study looking at drugs or drug pairs across one axis and outcomes across another axis, we can get propensity score distributions in order to see whether there's a valid study of this drug and this outcome um, on a wide scale across multiple databases instantly. And if I can have the, the next animation, if we drill down into one of these shell, these, uh, small graphs, we see that, for example, in this case, we've generated a study that where there's good overlap of the propensity score. And this means that a study comparing these two drugs is probably feasible. There are other examples, and I'm not going to drill down into them, where this is much more uh, this is much more complicated and we're much less likely to be able to do a study. Uh, if I could have the next uh, slide, please. Um, I'm going to turn it back to Kim, but I'm going to comment on some of this as well as we talk about enablers, things that make uh, federated analyses uh, easier or the abs or their absence makes things more difficult. So, I'll, Kim, over to you. Great, thanks. And we can go on to the next slide here. Um, so this is first of, of two pieces on what we need um, to support federated analysis, and and it. it um, so first is just acknowledging current differences that that can make a difference in how we approach this. So one is the differences in privacy laws. There's also policies and practices in different jurisdictions. And of course, as I've already indicated, the data collection process, data generation process is different. So we, there are differences that um, that mean that there's uh, additional work that needs to be done. It's there's not magic of just putting data in one location and all of a sudden they're they're comparable. There's, this is the, the acknowledgement of the work that needs to be done. So then the challenges that go along with that are um, multiple. The, some of it is cultural and organizational. Um, do people want to share data? Are they able to share data? Um, there's stewardship and approach to risk and decision-making about whether 
Data can flow outside of institutions or across borders. There's a size and complexity of data. If we're thinking about genomic information, um, that can be very complicated to, or, or imaging, it's a, the, the data file sizes get so large that often they need to stay where they are because of the technical complexities of providing protection. And then there's a, just the data curation and preparation and documentation pieces. As, as Robert indicated, there's a lot of work to be done in making data ready for analysis. And um, we haven't necessarily invested in a lot of that. And this would be also our ability to make data fair, meaning that they're findable, uh, uh, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So Robert, what do you think? Yeah, I, the only thing I want to add to this in terms of what is needed here is the the challenges as you see them here are primarily not technological or or methodological these are these are things that we know how to do and i know there are there are people on the in the uh, audience today who have a lot of expertise in doing this through a variety of groups the challenges here are primarily at the level of the the legal, political, and financial side of getting the energy and funding behind these things and the the impetus behind these things to actually do them. The technical, technological and methodological problems are relatively um, relatively manageable. Indeed. Um, and they're in increasing in capabilities all the time as well. This is part exactly. of the interesting thing of this area. Okay, to the next slide, please, then. So the kinds of things, and, and then sure, this is absolutely not comprehensive at all, but the kinds of things we probably need to think about for supporting federated analysis will be um, some kind of common governance framework for the nodes that are participating. So this doesn't mean that um, different jurisdictions, whether we're talking international or just within Canada, need to have the same um, rules and set up for everything. But at least when we're talking about the federated systems, there's got to be some commonality to make it into an actual um, federation. Um, there's going to need to be some form of common data infrastructure, uh, I, ideally in, integrated with existing structures, meaning we don't necessarily need to build entirely new things. We can leverage the, the investments that have already been made. Um, but there, there does need to be um, there. There, at, as Robert said, this is not the biggest problem, but it is an investment that needs to be made. We need to have agreement on data standards for harmonization, um, because federated analysis assumes that there are harmonized data or a common data model in place. There needs to be adequate local and centralized computing software and capabilities, tools, and so on to support people. There's likely to be need to be training and learning resources for users because as I um, briefly indicated earlier, there's sometimes a different um, methodology or protocol used to run a federated analysis. And there's lots of different flavors of that. You'll hear more about that over the series. There's going to be um, need to maintain our commitment to um, inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility, to public engagement, to indigenous data sovereignty, and to other fundamental features of good health data analysis. So this is not just a, we don't want to um, think of federated analysis as creating a free for all in the same way that we wouldn't think about pooled analysis as creating a free fall. And then I think in, implied in all of this is that there's sufficient financial support to actually do this sort of thing in an appropriate and sustainable way. Robert, back to you. Uh, yeah, and not much to add on this slide other than you've you've said this well. There needs to be financial support. These these networks like C nodes, like HDRN, like Odyssey, take a lot of baseline fixed cost work in order to be able to run. Uh, studies again the technical side is not not so much the problem the problem is implementation and 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 being able to use the technical expertise that we that we have we can go to the next slide so um perhaps before i we go into the what's coming next in the series i i will pause here um and i want to acknowledge 
um, the way that we went about setting up this series. Uh, so it, we uh, established a steering group of internal and external members who are experts in the field of, um, well, many different fields, whether it's statistics or they've had some uh, experience like Robert in doing distributed um, and other kinds of meta-analysis and so on. Um, and they've contributed the, their time and expertise to putting together the whole learning series, uh, the, um, the topics, some of the speaker's suggestions and all of that. And it, it, this really would never have been able to come together without them. So I, I just want to acknowledge um, Robert and myself participated on that. But in addition, there's Charles Burchill, who's based in Manitoba, Daryl Fung, Amy Fryer, uh, Joanne, uh, Joanne Provencal from the Canadian Research Data Center Network, Grant Gibson from CRDCN as well, Michael Patterson and Stephanie Dixon from ICES, Claudia San Martin from Statistics Canada, um, Mark Fume from DNA Stack, and Bryce Pickard from Integrate AI. Um, so we really would not have been able to, to put something together uh, as comprehensive, I think, as thoughtful as this without a lot of that, uh, th that expertise and input. And then I also want to acknowledge um, our uh, David Yang and Alexandra Royne, who has been our host today and our comms team for being able to, uh, that's, and that's Tasha Rennie, Jasmine Omar, and Kate Milbury, who make all of these things happen. So, okay, so now going on to what will come next. Um, we have a timeline that's going to run through July. So the idea here is the next uh, two, ser two sessions are going to be February and March, and that's on the current approaches for distributed analysis. So the first of these is going to be a presentation, and then this, uh, the second piece will be a panel discussion. And that's really to go into much more depth about what Robert gave you a little piece of, of today on uh, the different ways that we can um, think about the, the current practice of distributed analysis. And then in April, we're going to have a session on the statistical review with distributed data. So the idea there um, is that um, we, we want to think about what is uh, what we know is possible that can be done in a robust way um, with um, current statistical or using federated data, what we um, suspect or know can't be done very well with distributed uh, and federated data. And then I think likely a whole piece in the middle of where there's um, interesting scientific and methodological developments to be had that, that could push us in a, in a, um, to a situation where more is possible. So that's April. And then next slide, please. May will be a panel discussion on artificial intelligence and federated learning in the federated landscape. There are some different considerations and implications for AI in a federated environment. So that is, uh, we wanted to have a specific focus on that. In June, we'll be talking about trusted or secure research environments and their role in supporting federated analysis. This is what I was referring to in terms of the nodes, the places where people actually have the, the data stored and that re um, researchers can have access to in, in some way uh, or form. So that's June. And then next um, July is the uh, um, possibilities uncertainty in the future, future federation. This is where we're going to try to bring together what we've heard, the themes that have come out. And I'm sure this will be informed by questions and comments from participants and listeners and so on. Um, so your comments and questions today, the responses to the evaluation forums uh, today and in the future events are all going to inform what happens in July. And then we are still considering whether it would be beneficial in the fall of this year to bring together a hybrid event um, that would help us to, to sum up, uh, consolidate what we understand, and then make some plans for next steps. And so Robert, anything that you want to add on this piece? Other than I'm looking forward to it, no, I think this is going to be fun. <laughs> yeah, me too. Me too. Um, so I think with that, we can go to the next slide that we are ready to go to uh, Q&A. So thank you. And um, to you, Alex. Thank you so much, Dr. McGrail and Dr. Platt for that great presentation. So they said um, we have some time for Q&A. So uh, if you have any questions, uh, please write them into the chat. Um, and We'll start answering them. There are a couple that came in during the presentation. So the first one is, what about equity uh, 
diversity and inclusion and federated analysis. Are you able to comment a little bit more on that interaction and considerations? I'll start with this, Robert, and I'm happy for you to add in. I, I, I um, thank you for the question because I think um, I touched light, very lightly on this, but to, to me, part of the part of the reason to think about federated data has to do with um, the way we think about data stewardship, and data stewardship has to do with the way we think about community involvement. So as we understand, uh, well, acknowledge and respect the fact that the the large portion of the data we're talking about in this context of Health Data Research Network Canada and many of our partner and collaborative organizations, it's about people. And so people have an ongoing interest in uh, the, that are in these data and that might be affected by data use have an ongoing interest in how they're being used, um, who has access to them, what the questions are, how they're interpreted and so on. And so if you think about federated analysis, one of the things that it can do is really help with ongoing stewardship, ongoing oversight, ongoing assurance that 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 the um, the expected norms, the expected rules are being followed. So this to me lines up very much with data sovereignty. Um, and consent, of course, is a is another layer, although many of the data that we use here are are um, they come with authority based rather than consent based collection. So I think that the principles of EDI kind of um, or ideas we call them in HDR in Canada really reflect in that data sovereignty piece. Um, but they also need to reflect into the way we think about actually creating the harmonized data or common data models as well. So there's lots of places where this plays in. Uh, and I think that these are additional tools that can help us uh, really respond to that appropriately. Yeah, I'll just add a couple a couple of things more from the the analytic end of the of the question. Um, on the one hand, uh, it's really critical that we have a, a good understanding of, of who in, is in our data sets that we're working with and that there aren't systematic exclusions. And we know that in administrative claims databases, um, we know that in an American insurance databases, there are going to be systematic in, uh, exclusions that are going to have negative effects in terms of uh, disadvantaged communities being parts of the the data so we have to we have to work hard to a make sure that the data are as comprehensive as possible and b that we understand the 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 gaps uh in the in the data sets that we're working with the second thing and and Kim alluded to this a little bit too is we have to really try to be careful when we're doing things like common data models, not to flatten the diversity out of the data sets. That is making sure that we're capturing the heterogeneity, the, the variability, the important aspects of the, of the di diverse populations that enter into the, the studies so that we're tracking population differences. And in, in the case of things like C nodes, we're tracking differences in risk or relative risk of uh, adverse events related to drugs. So here, there's a there's I think still a, a fair amount of work to be done, and it's an important it's it's an important area of ongoing research. Thank you so much. There's another question here about, is there some steering that might be done on policies through report cards highlighting best performers regarding transparency and some barriers perhaps need to be eliminated and eliminated and not accepted as given? Well, that's that sounds like a great idea. So I mean, I, maybe that's, uh, I would just mark those, these, some of these questions and ideas down um, for us to consider as we go through the series. But if one of the things that came out um, from this is a, a, a recommendation that we um, think about these kind of pooled, distributed, federated, I'm sure lots of things in between uh, kinds of systems and then understand the, the barriers and challenges. And then as, as the question asks, create some sort of report card that, I mean, I think that another way to think of about this would be a maturity model or an implementation model and, and a way to sort of grade 
whether we're actually doing everything we can to support all of the science that can be done. So I, I really like the idea. Nothing, nothing to add from me on that. So. Thank you. There's a comment and question that the three-way division among distributed, federated, and pooled is a good start, but it isn't essential to subdivide the federated group of approaches according to the kinds of information data that needs to flow among or between the nodes. And in particular, there is a major division needed between data that are personally identifiable and data that are not. For example, correlation coefficients and in iterative fitting process. So what divisions are needed or not needed? So I'll, I'll, I'll start on this one. I think um, uh, Michael Wolfson, who asked the question, is, is right that federated is lit, refers in to a broad group of analytic approaches. And the ones I've been describing so far are sort of at the, the basic end of that in that analytics are done in each site and then summary statistics are sent to the, the coordinating center. Um, Michael and others have worked on methods where, as you say in the question, um, lower level de-identified summary statistics can be sent to the coordinating center analytics can be done and then sent back to the sites and then conducted in an iterative process. Um, Michael's group has worked on this. The US uh, FDA Sentinel group has worked on this as well. Um, these an these ana analytic methods have um, a lot of advantages in terms of being able to either get closer to or get exactly to in some cases the the summary statistic or or the summary analysis that could have been done had we done a pooled analysis and i think there's a lot of in this case i take it back there's a lot of technical work to be done in terms of being able to do these kinds of uh studies and and analyses at scale i have nothing to add on that thanks so much uh, question um, Claudia, there is mention of integrated infrastructure as an enabler for federated data analysis. And do infrastructures that store the data need to actually be connected to do federated data analysis? I think that's a, a, a fair kind of um, addendum to the previous question. And, and the, the answer is no. Um, what you what you do, it and it, again, there's this sort of so even within the federated analysis, um, and I'm still learning myself, but there's clearly a, a spectrum of approaches um, that can be done there. But you could, for example, not have any kind of technical connections between your different nodes on in your federation, um, but download what's allowable um, within your first secure environment, share that securely with a second and um, secure environment, upload that, and then run an analysis. Like it, you could do this essentially by email for sure. And in some ways we've, we've thought about, maybe that's a, a reasonable way to start if what you're then sharing back and forth are things that are already allowed in the governance world to come off of your secure environment. The advantage of actually creating the technical connection really just has to do with um, efficiency and, um, starting to eliminate some of the um, possibilities for mistakes or things getting dropped and, and frankly, speed. But Robert, do you have more to add there? No, that, that I think you covered it well. Thank you. There is a question from Lee Green about uh, lexical compatibility. And where do we stand with understanding the issues of lexical compatibility across provinces, for example, with horizontal and vertical federation. Robert, do you want to say anything about that from CNOTE's perspective? Um, I guess I will, I will give sort of a, a small answer, half answer, and probably defer the, the, the longer answer to 
uh, a later session and um, and where we're where we're going to talk a lot about uh, common data models. It has not been too bad with the Canadian claims databases, mainly because we're dealing with just insurance health insurance claims rather than uh, lab values. Um, there we're dealing with maybe different ICD coding systems, but the the crosswalk of of terms is relatively straightforward. I think you you raise a really important point when it comes to uh, lab or clinical values, where, as you say in the question, um, hemoglobin A one C may mean you know a, a certain value in one hospital in their lab may mean something different from another hospital in another lab because of, of uh, measurement processes. That opens a whole complex, uh, as you say, can of worms that is not easy to, to work with. There is a question from Ed about whether uh, will federated data have some indication of its stable duration so data users have an expectation the federated data will be available long enough to complete an analysis. Oh, that's interesting. That's a great question. And I, and I, I think that there's probably lots of ways that you could construct federated systems, they, they could be, um, I think I saw another question that had an open data kind of component to it. Um, they could be federated systems that sort of stand up um, and are generally available if you pass certain tests. They're, they're, but I think the way that we have been, or at least I have been thinking about this is more akin to the way we run um, data access approvals now, which is you get approval for a particular project for a particular set of questions, and that will allow for a certain period of time. And that's all governed by agreements. And so it's very, very clear when you get access to the data, what time period you have and any allowances for asking for additional time if those that's needed. So I, I think if the, if the question is, do we run the risk of being surprised when data all of a sudden disappear? I don't, I don't, and that wouldn't be my first worry about going in this direction, but I, I can see where the question comes from. Yeah, I'll I'll just add that that there there this is an important thing to be keeping in mind because um, just defining stability of the data is is an important consideration. That is, we've we've seen cases where we we download a data set from either a province or from. Uh, one of our other data providers on a certain day, we do some analyses, download the same data for the same people for the same time, but because record cleaning has been going on in the past, we've no longer downloaded the same the same data set. So understanding, you know, and saying we downloaded the UK CPRD database for January 1st, 2015 to January to December 31st, 2022 on January 15th, uh, 2024, that at least time stamps the, the data cut that we got doesn't necessarily mean that we can go back and, and recreate the analyses if we download the same data in the future. But keeping track of all of these things is a critical part of doing this, uh, of doing this well and in as reproducible as possible a way. Thank you very much. It was touched on a little bit that there's a question from Srinivas. Uh, is there a possible world that could combine open data uh, as required for many clinical trials going forward and federated analyses? I think I'd like to say to Srin, I hope so. Uh, and I'd, I'd like to sort of, um, I think it would be interesting to design what that might look like. Although we, we work with some some data sets that are never going to be open in the sense of it being freely available under all circumstances, but I think reducing the barriers. Um, some places have gone to certifying researchers. Um, there's all sorts of things that could be done um, if we sort of stabilized certain things and made made some investments. And um, yeah, so I, I think that would be worth talking about more. There's a question from Amy wondering if 
speakers have advice or thoughts for approaching the development of common data models or harmonizing data when encountering, encountering variables that appear to be identical or at least similar, but are in fact capturing different concepts. For example, data on sex at birth um, is often mislabeled as gender. I, I mean, I know this is gonna be a big topic for the next two sessions. So Robert, do you wanna? Yeah, I think that's, I think um, this is a, this is a challenging problem. Um, and there are, there are different ways to approach this um, ranging from working to be very common with the common data models at a fairly early stage and doing a lot of work to harmonize data early on to treating this on an almost case by case basis. And there's different workloads and different timing of workloads to both of those. So we're going to talk a lot about this in, in sessions two and three, and there are going to be people who are, who have more expertise in doing this than I do uh, on this as well. So we'll, we'll have a, we should be able to have a good discussion of this.